Hey guys, look what we've got to feast our eyes on today. <clears throat> this is a vintage Akai 1710W. It's upside down, I realize. I've, in my impatience and enthusiasm to start working on this beast, I didn't bring out the camera. But um, we have a few things that need to be done to this old beast. It's basically in working condition, so there's not really there's not a lot wrong with it. Um, the, the controls are noisy as old hell and the light bulb here doesn't work anymore so maybe we, maybe we'll find some other source of light for that like some LEDs or something because I don't have any light bulbs but uh, other than that I there's really not a heck of a lot wrong with this thing this is an old unit that's been in the family since uh, about 1968 and uh, it was my dad's old uh, unit that was, and it's got quite a story behind it. It was, it was given to him in 1969 from a captain of a Japanese ship that the first maiden voyage to the Canadian port that uh, my dad worked at. It was always custom for the captain to bring a gift, and this was the gift that he gave my dad back in 1960. I guess it would be 1969, the uh, first time this ship sailed over here from Japan. And, um, I mean, it was in pretty good shape when he got it. It's not in, tr you know, it's not in terrible shape now. There's some parts that are missing because it's been sitting for a long time. Like, I, I, I have, I've misplaced the cover for the, uh, the heads. Um, I've got it all apart because I'm lubricating it and cleaning it now, but I'm going to clean these controls on this thing here and make this thing sound like a million bucks. It's been sitting in storage for at least 20 years. Um, I say it was my dad's old unit, and I was a fancier of reel-to-reel -reel tapes, but I wanted something a little more, a little more high tech. So when I bought my first reel-to-reel -reel deck, I went a step up on this thing, and this thing was just kind of just left sitting and um, hasn't been used in a lot. Now there are some problems with it. The, the DIN jack was removed for whatever reason. I don't know whatever happened to that or what the story is behind that. So if I want to bring this thing back to stock, I'm gonna have to find a DIN jack. There's a broken connector here. Little JB Weld will, should be able to fix that when the phono inputs is broken. And that was caused by lying this thing on its back because this is one of these tape decks that didn't have the, the built-in uh, spindle holder. So you had to, you had to you had to get these rubber cups that hold the the tape reels on. And what would happen is, after a while, these things would wear out and it'd fall off. And then you'd have a tape reel that would fall off the thing when it's playing and end up with you know 100 feet of tape all over the floor. <laughs> um, so it was custom to, to lay the thing down. And of course, when you're lying it down with a connector sticking out the back, it breaks the connectors. But what I found really intriguing about this unit, this bad boy is these. This unit has a vacuum tube amplifier and you know what that means right? This sucker is gonna sound great. Both even with the built-in speakers it's gonna sound pretty good because these speakers on it are half decent size but uh, feeding it through an external amplifier this thing's gonna sound awesome and I have just the amplifier to feed it through too. In my listening room I have an all tube power amp 40 watts per channel so great sounding analog tapes through a great vacuum tube preamp into a vacuum tube power amp you're not going to get much better for that so here we've got our control cleaner mg chemicals neutral this is uh, one of the best cleaners you can find for controls and I used it over my long career in the um, AV service industry. We, this stuff was indispensable. So we're just going to give the controls. Some people will just shoot the controls down through the through the shaft and let the, let it drip in, but that's not the right way to do it. The right way to do it is to actually get into the controls itself and give them a good spray. Get a good coating of uh, cleaner in there, and then we'll just rotate the controls back and forth. That should clean up any gunk that's formed, any dust and so forth that's formed on the carbon uh, rheostat, variable resistor. 
while we're at it we'll give the uh, the tape mode selector switch and we'll give the record play switch uh, a shot of this stuff too won't hurt they haven't been cleaned in years and this will just remove all the corrosion and all the oxidization from the switch contacts and clean them up make everything sound like a million bucks so there's that one done the uh, tape mode selector switch is in the front here so I can give this one a shot right through the front here we'll move it over so that I get access into the inside the switch that should be sufficient and then we'll just clean that switch now what this switch does is this switch to, to selects the left channel the right channel or stereo and somewhere in here there should be a slide switch I gotta find it it should be it's probably right in here somewhere there should be a switch that detects record there it is there's two slide switches right down there and I gotta get I gotta get my cleaner into those as well so we'll just get the cleaner nozzle into the switch give it a shot give the other switch a shot and work the record play switches back and forth to clean the contacts that select between the record amplifiers and the play amplifiers to the head. This is a two head design so it does use record play switches. My other one is a six head design. It uses three heads for each direction, an erase head, a record head and a play head. So it doesn't use a record play switch, but it does use a switch to select between the banks of heads, between the forward direction and the reverse direction. I don't know what's worse, having record play switches to get dirty or having a, a, a head selector switch to switch the six heads back and forth. I think there's probably more contacts on the other one, more contacts to gum up. As you can see, the amplifier design here is all point to point. There's no circuit boards in here other than these little circuit boards here for the... Uh, to have the switches mounted on. Other than that, everything else is point to point wiring. I'm intentionally not sticking my fingers in here because I have had it energized and I'm sure some of these capacitors are probably still got quite a kick left in them. As tube equipment at the voltage it runs at, they run at typically three, four hundred, maybe five hundred volts. Um, they tend to hold the charge for a while and I really don't feel like uh, finding out that the caps are still charged in the sucker right now. But uh, that's about it for the maintenance side of this. I'm just going to, going to reattach this control. I've got to mix up some JB Weld so I can get that uh, control, I get that jack remounted that's broken. And then we're going to put this thing back together and see how it sounds. As you can see, I've got the, the jacks mounted again, sort of. They're in place with JB Weld. Should be setting up here in the next 15, 20 minutes or so. And then they, they, should, be, they should be good enough to plug plugs in. Uh, be nice if I could replace them. They're riveted in though, so it'd be uh, I have to pull this whole panel apart and to replace them. But um, if I could get the part, because I believe it probably they're they're riveted down to the main chassis back here too, so it's um, could be a challenge to replace them. I think if this panel were to be taken off, I could probably get some screw-on ones and replace them. Um, but uh, we'll try this and see. If that doesn't hold, then I'll be sourcing a couple of new jacks and we'll be replacing them. Okay, guys, this is what I've ended up doing here with this light situation. I, I took the old bulb. It's hard to see in there because I, I basically cut the glass. I broke the glass out so I could get the wiring in the back. I soldered a 100 ohm resistor into the base of the socket and then a couple of white LEDs to illuminate my meters in a very high-tech matter so that's we've got our, we've got our we've got our meteor illumination problem now resolved now let's put the sucker back together and see it work okay we have it all back together minus the headphone plug because I didn't have one to replace but the next servicing I'm sure I will get to that I've got a tape threaded up let's see if it plays Probably the tapes my dad used to listen to on it too. Actually, it is. It's one of his old tapes, number 13. 
and left me an old collection of about I don't know 20 or, or so uh, tapes that he had recorded back in the in the late 60s early 70s when he used this uh, unit wasn't really my style of music back then I guess I'm growing more accustomed to it now as I get older anyway there we go a nice classic Akai 1710W vacuum tube amplifier tape recorder stereo still works after all these years all it needed was a little bit of cleaning of the controls and a little upgrade to the LED or to the light bulbs now it's lit with LEDs and even though you don't see it here with all the bright lights on here it actually illuminates the meters quite nicely so there we go the units all back together and as you can see I've dimmed down the lights now so you can see my my nice blue glow to my my meters and if I crank up the volume on this unit here when you're playing back meters work with playback but they're controlled by the volume if you look around the back of this beauty you see the nice cool glow of the five tube amplifier so there's my 1968 Akai 1710W restored and basically all I needed to do was lubricate and um, clean switches and controls after 46 years it's amazing the thing works because it's been sitting in storage for uh, at least 25 years it hasn't been turned on but uh, as they say they, they don't build things like they used to and there's a testament to that 40, 46 years old still going strong and even though I thought it's going to need a new belt, try as I can, I can't stop the capstan from turning. So even though the belt isn't, isn't tight, there's not more than enough torque to spin the flywheel. It's holding the tape speed constant. Pretty remarkable. This goes back into my stereo cabinet now. I'm going to start using this thing again.